These people are creating a terrible problem in our cities. They can't or won't hold a job. They flout the law constantly and neglect their children. They drink too much, and their moral standards would shame an alley cat. For some reason or other, they absolutely refuse to accommodate themselves to any kind of decent, civilized life. This was said in 1956, in Indianapolis, not about blacks or other minorities, but about poor whites from the South. Nor was Indianapolis unique in this respect. A 1951 survey in Detroit found that white Southerners living there were considered undesirable by 21% of those surveyed. Wow. compared to 13% who ranked blacks the same way. In the late 1940s, a Chicago employer said frankly, I told the guard at the plant gate to tell the hillbillies that there were no openings. When poor whites from the South moved into northern cities to work in war plants during the Second World War, occasionally a white southerner would find that a flat or a furnished room had just been rented when the landlord heard his southern accent. More is involved here than a mere parallel between blacks and southern whites. What is involved is a common subculture that goes back for centuries, which has encompassed everything from ways of talking to attitudes toward education, violence, and sex, and which originated not in the South, but in those parts of the British Isles from which white southerners came. That culture long ago died out where it originated in Britain, while surviving in the American South. Wow. Then it largely died out among both white and black Southerners, while still surviving today in the poorest and worst of the urban black ghettos. Wow. Wow. Wow, bruh. I don't think y'all know what they just now said, man. Well, of course y'all know what they just now said, and I'm just surprised by what they just now said. Because a lot of people in the, in the hood, believe it or not, take a lot of pride in the culture of the hood, um, of the hood life. But they do separate themselves from any other group in the world. Even um, suburban people as well. They separate themselves from, from, from the suburbs. Like you ain't in the trenches. You're not a part of this, this what we got going on. And it's one of them type of prideful situations where it's like you're not welcome here. Don't come around here. If you come around here, something going to happen to you. And we love this life. And, you know what I mean, we, we don't mind living like this at all. As a matter of fact, we prefer it. And it just makes it worse and worse. <clears throat> At some point, people start. I really don't get it, man. While still surviving today in the poorest and worst of the urban black ghettos. It is not uncommon for a culture to survive longer where it is transplanted and to retain characteristics lost in its place of origin. The French spoken in Quebec and the Spanish spoken in Mexico contain words and phrases that have long since become archaic in France and Spain. Regional German dialects persisted among Germans living in the United States after those dialects had begun to die out in Germany itself. A scholar specializing in the history of the South has likewise noted among white Southerners archaic word forms, while another scholar has pointed out the continued use in that region of terms that were familiar at the time of the first Queen Elizabeth. The card game whist is today played almost exclusively by blacks, especially low-income blacks, though in the 18th century it was played by the British upper classes and has since then evolved into bridge. The history of the evolution wow. of this game is indicative of a much broader pattern of cultural evolution in much more weighty things. Southern whites not only spoke the English language in very different ways from whites in other regions, their churches, their roads, their homes, their music, their education, their food, and their sex lives were all sharply different from those of other whites. The history of this redneck or cracker culture is more than a curiosity. It has contemporary significance because of its influence on the economic and social evolution of vast numbers of people, millions of blacks and whites, and its continuing influence on the lives and deaths of a residual population in America's black ghettos, which has still not completely escaped from that culture. From early in America... You know, it's, you know it's so wild, and they about to start talking about some slave trade right now. 
Um, what's so wild is when you talk to people, and I don't like these conversations, and I'm not taking any shots at anybody if we've had this type of conversations before, but I just want to let you know, I, I don't like these type of conversations where people, when you have a conversation with someone, they want to constantly tell you about all of the bad things that happened to them, all the bad things that are happening to them, and all the bad things that they can see coming down the road. It's like, mm -mm, nothing but positivity around me. We don't have to compare bad things in order to relate, in order to have a closer relationship or even a friendship. We don't have to do that. I would much rather we not talk at all than to talk about the things that happen to us because then we'll be, tra uh, we'll be trading um, our darkest stories back and forth just to see which one of us were oppressed the most. Oh, your people was from slavery. Oh, but guess what happened to me? I'm, I'm, I don't have any arms, and I don't, and I got cancer. And it's uh, come on, ooh, no. I lost this person and that person and this person and that person. No. How does that benefit either one of us? Like we, we are not going to sit here and play. Um, name your darkest moment. That's not a game that I want to play. We all come from stories. We all have a story to tell. And if we don't, our parents do. If our parents don't, our parents' parents do. If, uh, if they don't, the ones who made them do. Like somebody has a story that just will break your heart if they told it to you. But then people be waiting. Like as soon as you're done, oh, I can't wait to tell you what happened to me. The thing that caused trauma my entire dag on life. And because of that trauma, I feel like I'm owed the right to, to be lazy, to not work for what I want, to just be in a, in a, dark, um, a dark place for the rest of my life, to always make up excuses for not accomplishing the things that I want to set out to accomplish. Like, it's so many, a lot of people use those as crutches. And people want to know why I'm going down this road of trying to get this conversation started. It's because... We, if you look at Ukraine right now and everything that's going on, it's, at some point, us as, a, as, as, as Americans, I'm just going to stick to our country. Us as Americans, we need to stop all of the BS, stop all of the infighting, and understand that we are all we have. Yes, people that come to America are from everywhere. I get it. But at the end of the day, if things turn left and we have to deal with these other countries, dude, how, what did you do to really try to make sure that everyone, even if the, even the people who thought opposite of you um, was, was on, on the right track, just in case um, we all had to come together? It's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of our families like all of this infighting because you you rep the red and I rep the blue, you rep the you rep the um, um, Democrats and I rep Republicans, vice versa. I'm in the middle and I don't want to deal with none of y'all. Like, come on, man, we we're so entitled and we believe that we have the right to to be separatists the way we are, which has still not completely escaped from that culture. From early in American history. Foreign visitors and domestic travelers alike were struck by cultural contrasts between the white population of the South and that of the rest of the country in general, and of New England in particular. In the early 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville contrasted white Southerners with white Northerners in his classic Democracy in America, and Frederick Law Olmsted did the same later in his books about his travels through the antebellum South, notably Cotton Kingdom. Cotton the cultural values and social patterns prevalent among Southern whites included an aversion to work, proneness to violence, neglect of education, sexual promiscuity, improvidence, drunkenness, lack of entrepreneurship, reckless searches for excitement, lively music and dance, and a style of religious oratory marked by strident rhetoric, unbridled emotions, and flamboyant imagery. 
This oratorical style carried over into the political oratory of the region in both the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights era, and has continued on into our own times among black politicians, preachers, and activists. Touchy pride, vanity, and boastful self-dramatization were also part of this redneck culture among people from regions of Britain where the civilization was the least developed. Hold on, man. Why they show T.D. Jakes? Why did they show T.D. Jakes? What you trying to say about T.D. Jakes? You don't say nothing wrong about T.D. Jakes. You leave T.D. Jakes out of this, brother. Huh? You don't say nothing about no dag on T.D. Jakes. This redneck culture among people from regions of Britain where the civilization was the least developed. They boast and lack self-restraint, Olmsted said, after observing their descendants in the American antebellum South. While Professor Grady McWhiney's cracker culture is perhaps the most thorough historical study of the up, values guys? and behavioral patterns of white Southerners, many other scholarly studies have turned up very similar patterns, even when they differed in some ways as to the causes. Professor David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed, for example, challenges the Celtic connection thesis put forth by Professor McWhiney, but shows many of the same cultural patterns among the same people, both in Britain and in the American South. Popular writings of the 19th and 20th centuries have likewise described similar behavior, including the Indianapolis residents' comments on white Southern migrants to that city, which sounds so much like what many have said about ghetto blacks. None of this is meant to claim that these patterns have remained rigidly unchanged over the centuries, or that there are literally no differences between whites and blacks in any aspects of this subculture. However, what is remarkable is how pervasive and how close the similarities have been. These people... Wow. Sheesh. Mm. Hopefully this was uh, another wake-up call that we are all the same and we need to dag on understand that. We are the same, bro. We are the same. Y'all let me know what y'all thought about that in the comments below. If you have yet to hit that subscribe button, please make sure you do so on your way out the door. Once again, guys, I am Van, and now we are all the LFR family, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video, hopefully inside of the Patreon as well.